Harvard Divinity School. Translation as Linguistical and Bodily Metamorphosis in Missionary Encounters in Indigenous Amazonia, March 30th, 2023. Good evening and welcome. My name is Charles Stang and I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to this evening's event, the annual Hackett Lecture in Global Christianity. We're very excited to resume the annual Hackett Lecture, which has been in hiatus since the pandemic disrupted our in-person programming. We're especially excited to welcome this evening's speaker, Aparecida Vilasa, who is Professor of Social Anthropology at Brazil's Museu Nacional, Latin America's premier center for ethnographic theory and political anthropology. Her work focuses on indigenous perspectivism and sociocultural change. First trained in biology, she's carried out ethnographic research among the Wari people in southwestern Amazonia for over three decades and has published extensively in multiple languages on indigenous agency, embodiment, kinship, cannibalism, conversion to Christianity, and ecologies of knowledge. Professor Vilasa was the first global South visiting professor at the Department of Anthropology at Princeton University, and was previously affiliated with Stanford University, Cambridge University, King's College, uh, Ecole de Hauts Etudes en Sciences Sociales, the University of Ber Bergen, and Universidad Autonomia Autonoma de Mexico. Professor Vilasa's lecture this evening is entitled Translation as Linguistical and Bodily Metamorphosis in Missionary Encounters in Indigenous Amazonia. Before I invite the, uh, or, or give the digital floor to Professor Vilasa, I'd like to announce the center's next online event. Next Wednesday on April 5th, 1 p.m., Dr. Natalie Dyer will be speaking on Reiki, Energy, Medicine, and Post-Materialism. That event is part of the Center's Nociology series, hosted by my colleague Giovanna Parmigiani, who is a research associate in the Center's new Transcendence and Transformation Initiative. That will also be a Zoom webinar like this, and we'll put the link to register in the chat function. As always, the best way to stay abreast of what we're doing here at the Center and its programming is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. So this is how the evening will unfold. I will soon disappear and Professor Vilasa will appear to give her talk. When she's done, I will reappear to manage the Q&A from the audience. If you'd like to pose a question or a comment, please do so with the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please indicate if you'd prefer that your question remain anonymous. If we only have time for some of the questions, rest assured that we'll pass on all your questions and comments to Professor Vilasa so that she can see what her remarks provoked in you. Without further ado then, Professor Vilasa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Stang, for the invitation. And also, of course, I, I, I want to thank the Center for Global Religion and Harvard Divinity School. I'm very honored to be here giving the annual Hackett Lecture. Thank you so much. Well, in this seminar, I would like to reflect on the conflict between ontologies involved in the encounter between an indigenous Amazonian people, the Wari, and the evangelical missionaries of the new tribes mission based on the analysis of the different concepts of translation underlying this encounter. The choice of translation as a focal point is not fortuitous, since it's a central part of missionary activity as a whole, and particularly important to the work of the fundamentalists of evangelical faith missions, for whom the Bible was dictated by God from beginning to end. This means that it must be translated literally into the language of remote peoples. And not only for the missionaries, since the Wari, long before this specific encounter, found themselves concerned with the question of translation, reflecting in minute detail on it, 
as we shall see, although they conceived it very differently. It's not my intention to touch into the intense linguistic, philosophical, theological, and anthropological discussions concerning the concept of translation per se, since this, as well as being outside my field of competence, would lead me away from my central objective, which is to present the idea of translation implied in the perspectivist ontology of an Amazonian people in light of the contrast with the conceptions of a specific group of missionaries concerning the same topic. Missionaries' word translation. From its earliest moments, Christian missionary activity was intrinsically related to the work of learning native languages, taken as the condition of possibility for transmitting the divine message. In his analysis of the activities of Catholic missionaries among the Tagalog of the Philippines, Vicent Rafael shows that as early as the beginning of the 17th century, the Spanish king issued a decree requiring that all missionaries in the islands learn the indigenous language. The same policy was adopted in the American colonies, both in Mesoamerica and in the Andes. This was an explicit response to the tendency towards vernacularization propagated by the Protestant reform. Over the centuries and following the global expansion of Protestantism, which culminated in the faith missions created as part of the revivalist movements in the 19th century Europe and North America, translations were made into the idioms of native people around the world. For the fundamentalist missionaries who concern us here, preaching in the native language forms the core of their activity. In the words of a new tribes mission missionary, I quote, the missionaries have concluded that for the spiritual trusts to penetrate their hearts, to be understood and move them, they must be transmitted in the maternal language, even though some Indians know how to express themselves in Portuguese." End of quote. With this objective in mind from its outset, New Tribes Mission missionary training included studies of language and literacy, which would later focus exclusively on those trainees demonstrating more aptitude for linguistics. According to the missionary Johnstone, such people are able to capture a new language like children, offering information to the linguists outside the field area and thereby, I quote, cut down the time it takes to break down a language, end of quote. The linguist Bambi Schiffling argues that the idea of language as a code separable from cultural practices has been a recurring Western conceit, which presumes that, and I quote again, the vernacular could be expanded, contracted, and changed in myriad of ways to express ideas that were foreign and still remain the same vernacular, end of quote. The aim is to achieve word for word translations in the belief that the translations will thereby stay close to the literal meanings of the origin, original Bible text. Although personally disinterested in native cultures conceived to be little more than an array of errors, the missionaries need to understand at least some of their basic premises especially those relating to the religious universe. Since this is where many of the key terms to be translated are sought, including words for God, the devil, good, evil, and sin. The idea adopted, especially by evangelical missionaries, that the existence of functional equivalence 
in the words different language is based on a specifically relativist notion of culture, which is characteristic of the mainstream Euro-American thought. This presumes the existence of a physical world, a nature, let's say, that is given and universal, created by God for the missionaries, and whose shared elements are named differently by each culture, thus justifying the search for linguistic equivalence. Such cultural relativism is accompanied by a hierarchical and evolutionist element, which supposes Western culture to be the epitome of civilization, an idea reflected in a hierarchical conception of language, determining the practice of missionary translation. As we shall see now, while for the missionaries, there are two or more languages requiring the passage from one to the other, for the Wari, there is just one language through which people who live together can immediately communicate, irrespective of whether this is Wari, Portuguese, or a mixture of both. The Wari perspective on translation, words translation. For the Wari, translation is a complex operation which does not involve the search for new words to designate the same things, but different words designated by the same Life is based, therefore, on an awareness of the coexistence of different worlds and not, as among the missionaries and ourselves, different cultures with particular perspectives onto the same world. The Wari term for language is the same for mouth and tongue, kapiashi, our mouth, tongue, which designates not only this part of the body, but also the voice, lexicon, prosody, and oral tradition as a whole. Until pacification, which took place between 1956 and 1961, the Wari had no peaceful contact with any other ethnic group. The only differences in speech identified by them refer to prosody and to elements from the lexicon of people they call foreigners, members of other Wari geographic subgroups, inhabitants of neighboring territories, and speakers of the same language in a broad sense, and who maintain among them ritual and marriage relations. The Wari associate this difference with bodily peculiarities by referring to them as, that's what the body of the Orondao is like. Orondao is the name of a subgroup. It's worth observing that body, kwerishi, for the wari is what characterizes the person and refers not only to physical substance, flesh, but also to habits, affects, and memory. It explains why a person acts in a particular way, such as a quiet woman, for example, saying of her, ye kwerikem, that's what her body is like, so that's why she's quiet but not only the Wari. Although from the viewpoint of the Wari, they themselves are the only humans, Wari, they know that enemies, other indigenous peoples and whites, whom they call enemies, as well as animals of diverse kinds, including fish, various types of birds, snakes, and mammals, they see themselves as humans and may act as such Praying on the wari, which manifests as sickness and death, the victim. The subject imposing itself as a predator is considered human, wari, causing the other to occupy the position of prey, karawa, associated with non humanity. So, wari and karawa are positions, therefore, 
that define the difference within a wide relational universe in which all beings are human. Although both animals and enemies can occupy the position of humans, animals were the only ones, at least until contact, with whom the Wari had social relations, properly speaking, through their shamans. Through them, they know that animals speak the same language as themselves, Kapiakon Wari, people language, although they can be comprehended only by those who can hear what they say, a capacity that depends exclusively on the social relation established between them, especially living and eating together. The very concept of translation as the possibility of communication between different types of people, therefore, involves the shift from one collective of humans to another, and occurs through a bodily transformation enabled by new foods, the proximity to other bodies, and the new relations of sociality as a whole. The person thereby begins to inhabit another world, the automatic consequence of which is the capacity for verbal communication with these new people. In no case of encounters with humanized animals, whether mythic or historic, do the Wari mention language as an obstacle to communication. To them, it, seem, it seemed obvious that those who, receive, who perceive each other as human, as companions, automatically share the same language. Given the transparency of language and its determination by coresidence, it is understandable that the Wari do not share the same concept of translation as the missionaries, although they do elaborate this topic in minute detail, as we shall see. Translation through body, body metamorphosis. I turn to the account of an abduction by a jaguar, very common among the Wari until the recent past, which provides a very clear illustration of their concern with translation. The event was told to me in Sagarana village in July 2005, and the narrator and victim was Aain Tot, a woman of about 60 at the time we spoke. Various other local inhabitants were present. When the episode happened, I thought was about five years old. One day, the adults had sent the children to the stream to fetch water. I thought's mother then appeared and called her to come and catch some fish somewhere else. So she went along. She had no idea it was a jaguar since it looked exactly like her mother. On the way, they came across some palm fruits, much relished by the Wadi, and her mother took maize from the basket she was carrying to eat with the fruit. Soon after, a thorn pieced the child's foot, which her jaguar mother removed. At this point, the listeners lost in surprise. After walking for a while, they stopped to sleep. Milk was seeping from the breast of her mother, who was breastfeeding one of Aintot's brothers at the time. When the girl was almost asleep, she noticed a man approach who lay down on top of her mother to have sex. The girl asked, who is this man? So the mother smacked the girl's bottom lightly, as the Wari do to put a child to sleep. Again, the listeners laughed, very surprised, and asked for more details about this moment. The next day, they ate some palm fruits and carried on walking until the girl heard the voice of her older brother, who was shouting to her. At this point, the supposed mother said she was going to defecate and disappeared into the forest. 
her kin then approached. Ein Tot's body was covered in jaguar fur, which they cleaned off. At the end of the narrative, I asked whether she had not seen any trace of jaguar in the supposed mother, a bit of her tail or something similar, which appeared in other accounts I have heard. And she replied, nothing. It was truly my mother. Just how much the problem, how much of a problem translation is for the Wari becomes evident in comments made by the listeners at a specific point in the Jaguar account, when the narrator said that they stopped to eat palm fruit. What was it? A fruit? Someone asked. Seven banded armadillo. Palito, her husband, the, uh, the, 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 the woman who was uh, asking, uh, retorted, tail of six banded armadillo. Toshakwa, his wife, pondered, perhaps it was Paka. I don't know, the narrator said. And Toshakwa immediately corrected herself. That is it. Papaya is Paka, meaning for the jaguar. It is as though the listeners had Wari Jaguar dictionaries in their minds that they use it to translate what the narrator said. As can be seen, the problem is not finding equivalence in the Wari language to words spoken by the jaguar. It is presumed that the jaguar, to the ears of the girl who saw it as her mother, spoke Wari language, that is, a people language, comprehensible to all humans. The problem resided in identifying the word of the jaguar, the empirical equivalent to the words uttered by the animal. What is a palm fruit to the jaguar? As a jaguar, it cannot be the same thing as for the wari, who, in contrast to the girl who saw the animal as her mother, did not share its point of view. This is a clear example of what Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, the anthropologist, has called perspectivist translation, highlighting the difference between the standard Western conception, the one shared by the missionaries, and the native conception. In his words, and I quote, the problem for indigenous perspectivism is not therefore one of discovering the common referent, say, the planet Venus, to two different representations, say, morning star and evening star. On the contrary, it is one of making explicit the equivocation implied in imagining that when the jaguar says manioc beer, He's referring to the same thing as us, meaning a tasty, nutritious, and heady brew. End of quote. As the author observes, the capacity to translate is typical to the shaman who, through an experience of bodily transformation, can circulate through more than one of these discordant exteriorities returning to tell the Wari what he saw and heard. It is the shaman, therefore, who constitutes the lexicon of the Wari Jaguar Dictionary, to which my Wari friends resorted when they heard the abduction narrative. Given that each shaman has a unique experience, it makes sense that this dictionary has different entries for the same reference, which explains the oscillation and conjectures of the listeners concerning the relations between two references, rather than between two words. The verb meaning to transform in Wari language is yamu, understood as the actualization of a new body, one that is equally human since, since it's seen as such by the new companions in another relational context. This capacity is not limited to shamans who differ by being able to control the process, 
but it's common to all beings deemed human, wari, which includes, as we have seen, the diverse animals, as attested by the jaguar episode just described. It is the capacity of some beings to transform themselves, which leads to the attribution of a spirit or double to them. Although this very rough translation of spirit evokes the idea of a component of the person, something like a vital principle, the Wari notion, notion in fact resists any essentialization. The attribution of a spirit results from the capacity to transform, not the contrary. Nobody under normal condition has a spirit. Shamans, generally men, are like chronically sick people who, assailed by animals of a particular species, have not been cured and have turned into their companions. The Wari often say that animals prey on the Wari with the eventual aim of turning them into king, the outcome of which is death for the victim, who goes to live forever on the side of the animals. In such cases, the person's Wari body disappears and what goes to live among the animals is from the Wari viewpoint, the person's spirit. In the case of a shaman, the animals decide to cure him by bathing his body in apparently boiling water, after which his body is reconstituted. Henceforth, the shaman's spirit will be continually activated, implying the coexistence of two bodies, one of them living among the Wari which he perceives as human and king, and the other among the animals, which he also sees as human. The Wari typically say that the shaman accompanies the animal or the animal's spirit. With this double body, the shaman acquires a double perspective, that of the Wari and that of the animal species that he accompanies, which gives him access to animals as a whole, since, as they would explain to me, they do not differentiate a deer from a colored peccary or a jaguar. All are seen as people, and it's common for a shaman to change his animal companions and consequently his body simply by accompanying and eating with other species. This strange vision is precisely what allows him to act as a translator of perspectives. Given this con his continuously transformed state, the shaman is a being who circulates through distinct relational universes, living with different types of humans and learning about their language, or that is, about the distinct reference to which the same words from people language apply. The Jaguar woman as a dictionary, material translation. The following narrative shows that more than a capacity arising from the body, from bodily transformation, translation itself may be achieved by the body. In July, 2005, Toshakwa, a, a woman of around 65, wife of my wari adopted father, Palito, and who I call mother, narrated some events she herself witnessed when she was still a child and involving her mother. And the name of her mother is Aintai. What follows is a summarized version. One morning, when To was around five years old, her mother, after a discussion with her own older sister, went to the river and was invited by a young man, her nephew, to go fishing at a spot further on, where he claimed it. There was a lot of fish. The young man carried her on his back for a stretch of the path. After a while, Aintai began to hear voices calling her. It's an animal that called you. It's not Wari. Look, here's your daughter. She's crying a lot. 
and her two nephews shouted to the figure who was pretending to be him, put her down on the ground. This was when Aintai realized that the supposed nephew was licking leaves as they trekked along the path, just as jaguars do. She looked carefully and saw a glimpse of a tail. Hearing the insistent calls from her king, they left her behind and departed. According to To'o, my adopted mother, her mother was covered in jaguar fur from being carried by the jaguar. One day, sometime later, To'o's father killed a lot of capuchin monkeys in the forest. Seeing the prey, the mother put the monkeys in her mouth still raw and drank a lot of blood. She then spat out the liquid and To'o and other people saw that what emerged from her mouth was not blood, but bits of maize, maize chicha drink, a kind of beer. And we should recall that the jaguar's chicha is blood. Afterwards, According to To'o's description, her mother seems to have turned into a dictionary. Dictionary is my words, of course, which rather than substituting one word for another, transformed one object into another inside her body, a consequence of her double identity. On another occasion, she called her daughters to go bathing with her in the river. There they saw many tiny fish that the Wari called Wam. The mother told the girls, I'm going to fetch some insect larvae, wrap some leaves together to make a recipient for us to roast them. Meanwhile, the mother caught the little fish. When she showed them to her daughters, they were no longer fish, but insect larvae. So narrating the event to me exclaimed it the fish turned completely into larva. Other occasions like that happen in sequence. The efficacy of the body as a medium of translation, a kind of three-dimensional Google Translate, emerges here in its extreme and almost caricatural form when the metamorphosis of the person is objectified as a metamorphosis of the things surrounding him or her. The duality of the person's body, invisible to the wari, is expressed as a duplicity of things that are transmuted as they traverse the body. Those who observed Toho's mother, therefore, had the opportunity to live in two distinct worlds simultaneously, the world of the jaguar and that of the wari. But the idea of translation by the body is not limited to specific and rare cases like the one narrated above. Isn't the mimicry of whites common in the first context with, of native peoples around the world, a perfect example of perspectivist translation to, let us turn to some examples. Mimetism as translation. In his essay on the Christianization of the Tupinamba, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro cites various examples of what he calls a mimetic enthusiasm for the ritual apparatus of the missionaries. One of them taken from Father Manuel da Nobrega, first letter, Brazilian letter. And I quote uh, Father Manuel da Nobrega. All of those who have dealings with us say they want to be like us. If they hear the mass bell toll, they rush to attend. And whatever we do, all of them do. They kneel, beat their chests, raise their hands to the sky. And one of their main figures is already learning to read and observes lessons every day with great care. And in two days, knew the entire alphabet. And we taught him to bless, 
absorbing everything with great gusto. He says he wants to be a Christian. Writing about the Guarani of Paraguay, the anthropologist Graciela Chamorro remarks that at the mission village of San Ignacio de Paumbucu, the chief and, and shaman Miguel de Atiguaje, considered by Father Montoya a true minister of the demon, pretended to be a priest and, I quote Montoya, simulated that he was saying mass. He put some clothes over a table and on top of them a manioc tart and a heavily painted vase with maize wine and speaking through his teeth conducted many ceremonies showing the tart and the wine like the priests and finally eating and drinking everything. With, his, with this his vassals venerated him as though he were a priest. End of Quote. The impressions of the missionary Friedrich Scharf on his first visit to the Wari, just some, some time after the first context, revealed the same kind of mimetic behavior. Unlike the examples just cited, however, this imitation did not refer to the religious ritual per se. So I quote the missionary, while we were on the river shore washing ourselves, the Indians were on the bank watching us and trying to imitate us, our gestures. One of our missionaries used false teeth, and when we removed them from his mouth to wash them, imagine this. Two of the Indians also tried to remove their natural teeth from their mouth in order to imitate the clean gesture. End of quote. Mimesis involves more than simply the assimilation of the specific techniques. The descriptions of the mimetic behavior of native peoples indicates a central place reserved for the body and for bodily transformations in this process of apprehending another perspective. For Michael Tosic, mimes is an alternative science based on a sensual transformation. As Viveiro de Castro notes in his article on the Meridian Perspectivism, ritual paraphernalia, paraphernalia, like clothes, masks, and adornments, are instruments, not costumes, with the power to conjure metaphysical transformations. Among various examples, we have the Yagua people of Venezuela, whose shamans utilize clothing that allows their transformation into animals. Likewise, the Wari use of white people's clothing and the consumption of their food are both effective modes of transforming into whites that like shamanism do not imply a unique identity and far from being a process without return are founded precisely on this oscillation of positions. Further equivocations. In the encounter between the Wadi and the missionaries, obviously other questions emerged over time related to the translation between words, properly speaking, which the missionaries undertook with the help of native translators. The latter, the translators, as we might guess, were young people who lived close to the missionaries, sharing their food and habits which, according to the Wari, allowed them to comprehend what the missionary said. It's interesting to note that the term chosen by the Wari to express the idea of word translation, the passage from one language to another, is to imitate, repeat. However, the fact that the passage from one language to another is not problematized does not mean that reflection was not required from indigenous translators. It is precisely this point that I wish to examine briefly now in order to explore another type of equivocation, constitutive of translation, related to the conflict between distinct conceptions of the word subsumed by an apparent synonym. 
I shall take as an example the translation of the verb to love central to Christian discourse. This verb is absent among the Wari, who express the feeling love as to not dislike. Love for, for a person is conceived as the suppression of indifference and anger, precisely what people feel for enemies. One episode I witnessed firsthand seems to me a perfect illustration of the problem I'm trying to address. An artist from Rio de Janeiro offered to me and to my Wari adopted brother and father who were visiting me here in Rio, a red heart sculpted in wood. And I suggested my Wari brother, Abraham, that he give it to his wife as a souvenir of his visit to Rio. The next day, he came to me to show that he had written with a pilot pen in the middle of the heart the following phrase, I don't dislike you at all, Tem Shao, the name of his wife, dedicating it to his wife. This, what, this was what Abraham translation of the expression, I love you, frequently written on hearts depictions he could see in magazines and TV. It's interesting to observe the implications of this absence of a term for love in the translation of Christian hymns and biblical texts. One interesting illustration is the hymn which says in its Portuguese version that Jesus loves everyone translated into Wadi as, Jesus doesn't dislike you, you, and you. The apparent coincidence between the perspectives of the Wadi and the missionaries demands that we accentuate their dissonance. In their mutual work, the missionaries and the Wadi seem to have reached an agreement on the suitability of the term to not dislike, as the translation of the verb to love. Indeed, to not dislike is to love, which is clearly expressed by the text written by Abraham on the wooden heart offered to his wife. However, in contrast to the missionary con conception of love, as a natural basis for the relation between God and humans, and what good Christians should feel for each other and every person, the notion of love as not dislike reveals an entirely distinct starting point, a world of anger and enmity on which human agency acts as a transformative capacity. We are presented then with a radical difference in what is conceived as the innate universe and as the direction of human agency. For the Wari, kinship and love must be produced by themselves. And the failures in this process are conceived as resistance. That is, as the imposition of this innate word which entices them back. This attraction is what they identify as the devil and sin. For the missionaries, human agency is historically situated in the opposite direction, producing sin and hate from the paradise constituted by God for Adam and Eve. Lesson book one, written by the missionaries with the help of Wadi translators to be read during church services and which presents God and the creation, explains that everything created by God from the forest to the animals was initially good. I quote, God's things were very good in the past, just after he created them in the beginning. Everything was in entirely good. There were no bad animals. There was no bad forest. There were no thorns. He didn't know how to make bad things." End of quote. Evil first arose 
from the greed of Lucifer, one of his followers. Hence, although the present Christian world is one of original sin, which makes it similar to the innate world of the Wadi, it does not involve for the missionaries the true original world, but its fallen or corrupted version. As can be seen, an important difference is involved, though not one immediately visible, which provokes the illusion that they involve coinciding visions of personhood and moral action. The missionaries, observing the interest of the Wadi in suppressing anger, believed that the indigenous people recognized their corrupted state and wished to act in the same way as other Christians to overcome their state of original sin. As can be seen, both in the first and subsequent phases of the missionary encounter, important though not immediately visible ontological differences are involved which bring about the illusion that they involve coinciding visions of personhood and moral action. In the beginning, the missionaries observing the interests of the Wadi in imitating them, thought they were easy targets for conversion, soon to discover that they were also eager to resume their old customs. Transformation for them was not a one-way process, as the possibility of oscillation is a central part of it. In other words, difference must be preserved or the world become flat and paralyzed as Claude Lévi-Strauss showed us when analyzing the relations between Native American and the whites. Later on, when the language, when the work on language translation itself began, difference again imposed itself as a constitutive part of the innate world of the Wadi, becoming visible through the irreducibility of Christian concepts, like to love, to the Wadi language. Although superficially it seemed to the missionaries that they had found the perfect word-to-word -word translation they were looking for. The equivocity involved in the apparent coincidence of these movements accounts for the disappointment of the missionaries with what they call the superficial conversion of the Wadi and what seemed to them to be their main misunderstanding. Salvation would be based on actions rather than any recognition of Christ as our savior. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Aparecida. That was very interesting. Uh, I have to confess, I'm grateful that I have recently read Cannibal Metaphysics by Veras de Castro. So uh, some of what you said is familiar to me. Um, uh, the sort of perspectivist uh, ontology uh, that you were drawing on is, I mean, I, I, this is new to me, but I've read some of it. So it was, I could follow you. Um, and so before I begin, let me say for our audience, if you have questions for Professor Vilasa, please, put them in the Q&A function. And while you're doing so, I will presume to ask my own. So mm, I'm gonna try to summarize what I took to be some of your points, okay? And see if I've got it right. Is that all right? All right. Okay. So I think one of, I mean, one of the things that I think is so amazing about the anthropological work uh, in South America is bringing forward, of course, that there is a very developed and in many ways incommensurable metaphysics operating, uh, ontology and metaphysics operating among indigenous peoples and that we, and that the West has brought to bear its own metaphysical frame and it, and there are these um, problems if we don't recognize that there's a, that there is a fully intact metaphysics, although it's not a metaphysics, 
expressed in learned treatises. Um, it's a metaphysics expressed in um, largely oral cultures. But the thing that really struck me in your, your lecture, Professor, was the idea that different, it's not a matter as it is in the West of different words um, ref, or different languages referring to a common agreed upon world. It's that there are different worlds, as you put it, um, and one word or can refer to all of these different worlds, right? So an example of that was the fruit that the jaguar ate. What kind of fruit to a jaguar? What is fruit to a jaguar as opposed to fruit to a human? The same word fruit could have two different reference depending on whether it's a jaguar or a human. Okay. Um, and consequently, the whole enterprise of translation changes pretty dramatically if you're moving between these two different understandings of the world and language. Um, I have to confess also for someone, of course, raised on Western conceptions of Western metaphysics, it's, it's very challenging, but also thrilling to try to inhabit this worldview that you're describing. Um, so the question I have, sorry, that was a long, first of all, have I, have I, um, have I said anything inaccurate? Have I, I'm trying to, know. I'm getting it. Okay, good. So my one question I have for you is how successful are these in, uh, indigenous, these various indigenous groups in preserving their own metaphysics? <laughs> in the face of uh, a missionary metaphysics. Uh, in, to some degree, you begin to get at this at the very end of your talk when you're saying that the, the indigenous groups aren't behaving like converts in the way that the missionaries would expect them to. They're, they're moving back and forth. That suggests to me that they're kind of, they're, they're still committed to their metaphysics. But I'm wondering if you're witnessing um, if you're witnessing these indigenous groups losing their uh, commitment to their own metaphysics. Oh, yes. Uh, I, am, I am, you know, seeing all this happening. Um, so I, uh, I think that the missionaries work among indigenous people is very destructive. It's really something that goes evangelical, I mean, mainly nowadays evangelical because the Catholics after the, the Vatican Council, the, the Vatican transformation in the Catholic Church uh, mm -hmm. in the 60s, uh, the Catholic missionaries, they changed it completely their, their way to work. So they, they say that they respect indigenous culture and they, they, they allow, let's say, shamanism to happen and they, they like it. But evangelical, they are very radicals. Um, they are they are literalists and they are fundamentalists, and they say that everything that that the old people, that the ancient people, um, say are lies, because the devil was the one who spoke to them, who taught them. So everything was lies, and they were very powerful because, of course, they arrived with technology and medicine. So they show, they display their power. Um, although they, uh, they, they just uh, uh, do not talk about it. But they say, for example, when the Wari was there, um, they, were, they were very sick after, just after the contact. They were very sick. And the missionaries gave them antibiotics. And they say, this is not me. Uh, no, not this this pill or this thing that is curing you, but God. So they just associated their power with God. So it was not something very, it was very convincing, let's say. And the Wari, at the time that the missionaries arrived, two thirds of the population died uh, because of the epidemic. So they were very, very weak. And, and so it was really something that the missionaries arrived with a lot of power. So, but they were, so they were very destructive. And the Wari, 
uh, we're very impressed with those, you know, those manifestations of power. What, mm -hmm. what happens is that they, they begin to learn the language and they begin to just criticize their culture, criticize their way of, of uh, living, everything. And, and it just, of course, weakens their, you know, their, their way of life, their, 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 the proud, they were really proud of their culture. They, they like it, they think it's beautiful, but the missionaries kept mm. saying that it was horrible, horrible. So what I think nowadays, they do not, let's say, get back to their metaphysicals, like, um, because shamans, for example, do not exist anymore. But as the missionaries work with the native language and they, they know they are conscious that it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a danger. It's, a, it's very dangerous because um, the, when you use the native language, of course, you, the native culture is present. So they still work with the native language. And, and with that, Wadi culture and Wadi metaphysics get into their lives again. So when they say mm -hmm. to love and not to dislike is a way that they jump into this world where the basis is an enmity, the basis is, is not liking, and then human action is to like. So I think that the, the, the native language is very powerful to keep their metaphysics in, but in a very subtle and very kind of temporary way. So they get glimpses of it. Mm -hmm. But they do not, the body do not make their rituals anymore, their traditional rituals. They do not uh, have shamans anymore. So it is a heavy, heavy change. That is fascinating. Um, I, I, I think a lot of people will react as I did to the end of your lecture. That's the, the, the detail you, well, you just mentioned that to love, there's nowhere to love, but instead to not dislike suggests that the base layer of reality is actually a contest in which anger and suspicion that that is the baseline and human agency is what can intervene um, through kinship uh, can 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 complicate that 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 base layer and how that's a complete inversion of the Christian narrative uh, of the fall humans being the ones who fall in and I found that absolutely fascinating. I'm still trying to digest it. But this thing you've just said now is also enormously significant, of course, because it's it, what you've said is that although the, 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 the indigenous metaphysics is under threat by all this power of um, the missionary technology, just the fact that the missionaries are speaking in the Wari language means that the metaphysics is still potent it begins to speak back it Actually. begins to it has almost a kind of subaltern or um uh insurgent metaphysical pop power it pushes back against that which of course would suggest that um indigenous language revitalization is key for these metaphysics for this metaphysics to survive so language and metaphysics are integral, it sounds like you're saying. And there is something else because the evangelical missionaries, they offer them a very uh, important uh, character, which is the devil. And the devil, the devil uh, makes them, so the devil, like, like um, how do you say, encompasses all spirits everything so everything that belongs to this old world like animal spirits everything so the devil is is the one who uh, within christianity kind of abrogates kind of encompasses this spirit so the spirits are still there but it's the devil so christianity with this trickster the devil has has a, a very kind of gives the the, the, the indigenous people, they gives them their tools for them to go back to their metaphysics. So mm. it's, it's fair. So I think that the devil uh, is studying conversion to Christianity among different indigenous people in the world, 
uh, we see that the devil is central to for Christianity to be accepted because the devil is there. I see. Now, that is fascinating for me as a student of the ancient world, because when Christianity spreads throughout the Mediterranean and what we call the Middle East, it encounters worlds, uh, let's call them metaphysics, where there is a rich panoply of spirits and gods and entities with which people are interacting. But Christianity collapses that or groups all of that into either angelic or demonic powers. Mm. And under the demonic is the devil. What I, now I find, I usually regard that as a, as, a, as a kind of, it collapses the options because as, a, as an ancient Christian, you're either follow the angelic or you avoid the demonic. Whereas the negotiation of these entities and spirits is much more complicated. It actually looks much more like an indigenous worldview where you have to, you know, they're not always just good or bad. They're ambiguous characters, just like humans are. But what I hear you saying is the very fact that uh, evangelical Christianity affirms the existence of the devil allows for the continued belief in all these spirits. So it doesn't deny spirits. It doesn't try to deny the spirits that no the spirits are real but they're under the power of this adversary the devil and so that allows the indigenous metaphysics and practices to still work with these spirits is, is that i'm hearing that right perfect perfect i couldn't yeah. say better yeah that's fascinating okay well there's a question from the audience um i have i have more questions myself but i want to get one from the audience here it uh this is an anonymous question it reads, if I understand correctly, the Wari are an example of later contact or more recent contact. How do we imagine this has played out over time with much earlier contacts, such as in Mexico among the Maya, et cetera? I guess I'm now I'm now I'm paraphrasing the question. Do we imagine what you're witnessing with the, the Wari, do we imagine that that same kind of clash of metaphysics happened in the 15th and 16th? Yeah, yeah. Century? I do imagine, and, and anthropologists and historians, when they write about it, it's very similar. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the Wari case is very interesting and very um, several Amazonian cases of, you know, contacts between indigenous peoples and missionaries, they are very interesting because it's, you can see it happening now. So something that we, we can, we imagine that was happening in this uh, 15, 16, 17th century, they're happening now today among indigenous people in Brazil and, and Papua New Guinea, for example. So, and I think that there was this clash in, in Mexico. The point is that after uh two centuries let it, let's say they they something different happened so it, it's a moving thing so uh, as as was telling the, in the beginning the wadi did not have any conception of word to word translation and then they within time they began to 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 add to the missionaries to do translations so they begin to think about word to word translations mm -hmm. uh, but you know, so it was something that is, is changing and changing. So in the first, when you have the first generation of Christians and the second and the third, it's completely different. So in Mexico, we have, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 generations, uh, more, more and more. So it changes. So you have more hybridisms and more uh, mixing, etc. And we don't find it in now in indigenous Amazonia when people were catechized by evangelicals. They are very uh, so it's different also different also between you know because in Mexico there were more Catholic missionaries mm -hmm. and and here nowadays we have more evangelical missionaries. So so it depends on the kind of Christianity, even the the life story of the missionaries. Mm because it changes everything. There are some missionaries that are 
that they have uh, actions and they do things completely different and, and they, 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 the outcome is different. So not just the faith, if it's evangelical or Catholic, but the history of the missionaries, the history of the people, the conditions, the historical conditions, if they were dying from epidemics, if they were not dying. So things are different. I want to ask you a question about the figure of the shaman. Okay. You said uh, earlier that the shaman, by virtue of being um, someone with a double body who can move between the human and the animal, depending on what animal companions he takes up, that, that the shaman becomes um, a, translation, a translator of perspectives, that he becomes a translator of perspectives because he can, he can transform his body. Um, fascinating idea. It makes perfect sense within this metaphysics. Um, and, but I wanted to ask you, how do we know about this figure of the shaman among the Wari if, as you just told me, there are no longer any shamans. When I was, nowadays, I mean, but when I began my field work in 1986, there were plenty of shamans. Oh. I've been working among the Wari, because the Wari, they had the first contact with the New Tribes missionaries in 90, uh, 1956, 61. And they said, they, so this is history, I was not there. They said that they became, that they, they, they professed that they, they were Christians in the beginning of the 70s. In the beginning of the 80s, they gave up Christianity. They say they abandoned God because they were still sick. There was not, God was not doing nothing for them. So when I arrived there in 1986, they were traditional. Like they, they had shamans, they do rituals, etc. They reconverted in 2001 when they say they were watching there was a communal tv there in the village and they were watching the tv and they saw the the taliban attack to the world trade center the missionaries who were there told them that the end of war that was the end of war the sign of the end of the world so that who the the ones who were not christian they will go to they'll go to hell and they'll be roasting for eternity as prey and that they had to convert very quickly. And there was a revivalism. So lots of people converted, lots of people. And they stay converted until uh, nowadays. I don't know what is going to happen, but that's, that's what happened. Uh, how, how difficult that must have been for you to witness. Horrible. Horrible. So horrible. Yeah, that was very, very. And then I decide as an anthropologist, I decide to follow the Wadi. I always follow them. So they were going to church. I arrived there. When I arrived there after, I don't know, two or three years, I arrived there in 2002, January. And they begin asking me if the Taliban were already in Rio de Janeiro, if, the, if there was a war what was happening, that I had to tell them what was happening because they thought that this thing will happen, will arrive in their village. They were very scared. And, and I tried to explain, but anyway, it, it did not work. And, and so they were afraid of the end of the world because for them, the hell, the, you know, the Christian hell is really hell, meaning that they become prey because they, they spend their whole lives trying to differentiate themselves from animals. Because as I said, they see everyone as humans. They know that everyone see each, each self or he or herself as a human being. Although they cannot see the animals as humans, they know that the animals see themselves as humans. So they have to differentiate. So who is going to pray? So the one who prays just, gets this position the position of humanity so this is uh this is what they do so imagine the hell imagine you know they 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 figuring out that they will go to a hell where they will be roasting 
like prey forever and ever and ever. So they were very scared. They do not like, you know, the the heaven either. They they don't care about heaven. They say that in heaven, everyone will have a single house. You live by him or herself alone, which they hate, and <laughs> will be there writing the the words of God. God will be there. God won't be seen. God cannot be seen, but will dictate words to the body and they will get you know writing and writing the whole day so i asked them so this is hell isn't it they said no no this is this is better than becoming prey so fascinating so they are terrified of hell because it means a permanent condition of being prey perfect and predator um whereas so much of their efforts in life are differentiating themselves from prey, trying to be the human predator to the animal prey. But that heaven, this Christian heaven is not really attractive. So they're more motivated by fear of hell than um, attraction to heaven. When you ask, when you ask a wadi person, why did you convert? Why do you say you are Christian? They say, for not, the first thing is not to go to hell. That's the first answer immediately. They never say, oh, I want to go to heaven or uh, I, or they never say, oh, God, I believe in God. There is something inexistent. They don't say this. They don't say they say, well, God sees everyone. So God is more of a persecutor, someone who is always watching, always uh, ready to punish or so they are afraid of God. What an absolutely debased form of Christianity. Yeah. that they are being fed. I mean, that, I'm, that is very hard to hear. Um, I have a question that departs a bit from your lecture, but it has to do with the category of the shaman. So uh, I have an interest in the history of the category of shamanism, which of course starts very far from Amazonia. It starts in uh, Russian ethnographers of Central Asian uh, traditions. I'm wondering if you can say anything about how that title shaman, that category shamanism has been carried over into the Amazonian context. Uh, I mean, I know it's now very common, but how do you feel about it? Does it, does it fit? Obviously all these groups have their own names for this title, um, for this office, but how do you as an anthropologist feel about the category of shamanism? Well, first of all, shamanism is something very closely linked to um, to hunting activities. So, hunting peoples, hunting groups, they they tend to have shamans because there is always this possibility to co communicate with animals. So, in in Asia and Siberia, you have shamans, and they they talk with the prey, they talk with the animals. They so there are many the diverse uh, possibilities, mm -hmm. and we know that there was a migration from 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 this area to the Americas. So how that's how you explain shamanism here. So shamans, they are they are part of a world where animals are central central to their lives, to their thoughts, to their philosophy. And, and all those people in, in the Americas, there, is, there are a few exceptions. I, I really cannot name one exception. They, they, they have this extended notion of humanity. So humanity is not something that just belongs to us who see ourselves as humans, but we know that it's a large category. And you can see that in Siberia too. And, and so this category, this position of shaman is, is so central to do this mediation between this humanity and other humanities. And shamans in Amazonia depends on the, the, the ethnic group, but sometimes they, they become shame, shamans through uh, heritage. So uh, the, the, the son of a shaman, usually they are, they are men. That's why I, I say the shaman, he, because it's very rare that women uh, become shamans. This case of the, the woman uh, abducted by a jaguar, 
is a rare case because she became a shamer because she became a jaguar 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 woman because shamans are animal animal people they are animals and people at the same person at the same time and this woman she became a shaman and so shamans they are so crucial to this communication with with animals and 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 they are essentially part of this idea i told you that the the notion of humanity is extended to other people so you need a mediation you need a translator mm -hmm. so shamans they are translators and but they are not translators of words as i was saying but translation of words mm -hmm. so for you to access another world the world of uh, a species x or species y you need to have to change your body so you change your body and then you'll be able to understand what this people they are saying not the words because the words are the same but the reference you you understand which reference means what right so, so they're a translator of worlds and bodies yes true yeah. bodies translating worlds through bodies translating worlds through bodies so that's why I think that mimetism is uh, this kind of shamanism in practice in a way that, you know, it's a kind of collective shamanism because people, they are transforming the body. They are trying to transform the bodies to be able to become an animal, not an animal in this case, but a, a white person, an enemy or whatever, because they, they, they are trying, they, they cannot do that just uh, listening or learning words new words but they have to change their body well i have to tell you that i find this field this conversation of which you're a part and which you're helping lead so fascinating i come from another corner of the world right a much a, a world much more familiar to uh um the western academy the ancient mediterranean world early christianity the birth of Western metaphysics. And I remember when I was preparing for my general exams and I was asked to read Claude, Claude Levi-Strauss and I read The Savage Mind and uh, Totemism for the first time, I fell under the spell of those books. I found them fascinating. Um, and, it, and then more recently to pick up this, um, uh, to pick up- Cannibal's metaphysics cannibal metaphysics and to to hear you speak now it, I, it it's it's very it's very exciting it's it's really thrilling to be initiated into a completely different metaphysics and one that is not found in texts yeah that's true that's our experience there and i think that maybe people no, no anthropologists they will they might ask me but do you believe in this story of the person becoming a jaguar what are they crazy and or are they dreaming or did they take drugs whatever what i say is that it doesn't matter to me it's not my question my question is what kind of world those people are living in that's that's my question if it's true or not it's not my problem my personal problem my intellectual problem, I mean. So I want to, to be able to describe or to translate because I, I, I see anthropologists as translators too. We are kind of shamans. Um, I want to, to translate or to describe this word to, uh, to my colleagues, to other people. So that's, that's, that's the way. So it's not about believing or not. This is a kind of Christian question. And, I want to make anthropologists question. Well, I think it also, in, I think it also helps us question our implicit metaphysics, which is to say, as you start this lecture, you 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 put under you put under a question mark: Is there a consensual reality, and all languages are just different names for the for a stable reference? a stable world of reference. That's probably something we might want to question too. <laughs> so yes. if, if an encounter with 
um, what Viveros de Castro will call cannibal metaphysics, forces us to question that basic metaphysics we're operating with, then I don't need to I don't need to answer whether I believe the Jaguar woman became a Jaguar, but I might want to question whether there is one consensual reality and all our languages are just arbitrary signs pointing to the same reference. That's that's now even biologists they are studying that you you know the words for um, uh, you know, animals, they live in different wor wor worlds than we do and et cetera. So um, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting because in fact, what I'm trying to, what I'm studying and I've been studying for decades now <laughs> uh, is the encounter between those people who, um, who think about the body as the, 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 the site of the person, site of personhood, what consists of the person, and those missionaries who think that the soul is what is important. So, and those missionaries who think, as I said, that there is, as you were saying now, there is a common word, a common world, and and you know uh, uh, perspectives on it. So a tree is of course a tree, but uh, you call tree, I call it arbores, and the French person calls something else, but this is a word. And that's why we can, for them, word to word translations are possible because there is a common reference. But what if, you, if you're dealing with a people who do not see the word as this? So the word for those people is a different word. So they translate, for example, their uh, many of their their maize beer for my coffee. So when I say, so you see, so it's not just that. You see what what they take as as beer, I take as coffee, and so it it's that kind of translation. So it doesn't matter if I call coffee or or beer, but it's. Uh, uh, some some beverage, some something that I drink, either ritually or either during my day, etc. So that's that's what is important. That's where the focus uh, are, is where the focus is. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Professor Vilasa. Um, Vilasa, I'm saying it wrong. I'm working on it. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, I want to say this also, this, your lecture also reminds me of one of the first talks I hosted as the director of the CSWR, which was uh, Eduardo Cohn, after his oh, book um, came out, How Forests Think. Uh, so this is, um, it's reminding me of some of these very same issues. Yeah, Listen, this, exactly. this, this was, I'm sorry, what, were you going to say something? No, that's it, Eduardo Cohn. I was, I was about to mention his name because he, uh -huh. he was showing his book, How Forests Think, that there are several words in what we think is one word and, and that animals could talk in a way so, but we cannot understand, but they have uh, a way to, to talk. So. Yeah, it was, it, honestly, this is one of the most fascinating academic conversations I'm, I have had the pleasure of tracking. So thank Good. you so much. And you know, there is, the, we, we are, I am just launching a book with the philosopher Jeffrey Lloyd. I don't know if you know him. He's uh, from Cambridge and he's, uh, he studies ancient Greece and China. And he's a philosopher of science. Uh, it's, uh, his name is Sir Jeffrey Lloyd. Anyway, he was, sorry. No, go ahead, please go. Okay, so he, he was reading my book, uh, Palito and Me a book, uh, a kind of memoir that I wrote where I put all this kind of ethnography, but in a kind of fluent language, no academic language. So he was reading exactly about uh, the, the Jaguar story, etc. And he, uh, he kept asking me questions. Yes, that's it. Questions about this. Is she really transforming to a Jaguar? How do you believe it? So we at the end, we made a book, and the book is, 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 is being launched. The name of the book is Of Jaguars and Butterflies. I will write. Oh, my it. God. Well, would you two like, I, I would like to uh, invite you to come back and talk about that book. 
Of course, I can. And I, 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 we can ask Jeffrey to come with me because yes. he's, yeah, metalogs in, on issues of you know, anthropology and philosophy. So all those questions that you were, you, were, uh, you were asking me and other questions, he was asking me as a philosopher and I was trying to answer as an anthropologist. So we made it in the form of dialogue, metalogues, and uh, so that's all about this kind transformations and humanity etc okay i'm going to look that up take a look yes i will i will indeed thank you so much this was very rich and very um engaging so for those thank of you. you who are still joining us um i just wanted to say please be on the lookout for future events for the remainder of the semester Many of them will be like this one, Zoom seminars. And I want to thank Professor Vilasa again. And uh, I, I will, um, you it really intrigued me and I will be reading more of your work, including that your new book with, uh, with Jeffrey Lloyd. Yes, take a look and we can be together maybe to, to talk yes. with you. Yeah, that would be, we're gonna have the launch in Cambridge on May 17th. So May, yeah, May 17th. So we afterwards we can we can talk maybe, about it. Maybe in the fall semester. When, yeah. That would be yeah. lovely. Okay. In the meantime, I'm Thank gonna you. order a copy and read it. Thank you so okay. much. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you all. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good evening. Bye. Good night. Good evening. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.